you know, so that's the hardest thing. You understand climate change intellectually, uh, but also not emotionally. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third episode of the 2030 podcast with me, your host, Matt Lundy. Today, we are fortunate to have Professor John Chang from the University of California, Berkeley, a professor of geography and climate science, to talk to an interview uh, in this episode. So, uh, Professor Chang, John, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. So, uh, John is a professor, as I said, of geography and climate science. Um, but even past that, he also teaches a course on communicating uh, climate science. So a very relevant person to talk to, and I'm sure one who will have a lot of good insights for a podcast center, centered around climate change and talking about climate change. Um, with that, John, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit and tell us a little bit about your research? Uh, yes. Um, so I've been a professor for almost uh, for you know, several years. Um, uh, probably like 17, 18 years now. And uh, my field of specialty is climate dynamics, uh, which is the study of the physics uh, and the phenomenology of the climate system. Uh, so the sort of tools I use are uh, using observational analyses, uh, so like data from satellites, uh, from instruments, uh, from ships, and so on and so forth, and climate models to really understand uh, how the climate system works. And so the basic questions we ask are things like, uh, why the deserts? Uh, why does the monsoon fluctuate uh, from year to year? Uh, and one of the th things we do also ask is what's going to happen to climate in the future and uh, uh, as the CO2 concentrations goes up. Um, so, um, so I do some work in that regard. Um, and uh, so uh, an example of a recent study that was involved in, uh, my colleague Yelena Lukovic at the University of Belgrade in Serbia and I uh, looked at uh, change in rainfall over California using instrumental records uh, over the last, since about 1960. And the thing we found was that the rainy season, uh, the start of the rainy season has gotten uh, later and later as, as, as time progressed. Uh, so, and this is of consequence because that prolongs the wildfire season, uh, for instance. Yeah, yeah, so that's the sort of thing I do. Okay, uh, very interesting. Um, one from like a physical science point of view uh, for anyone in for the podcast that doesn't know, I went to Cal uh, and I did a astrophysics degree. So the physical science, I'm super interested as well. Um, unfortunately, didn't get to take any classes with John. But then anyone who might not be as interested, I guess, in the physics of it is still any anyone in California. The wildfires, uh, the droughts, the temperatures is super relevant. And as we're seeing year after year with massive wildfires, um, that's really important information to know, especially if it's changing and getting worse and how we're going to deal with that uh, moving forward. Um, so off of that, uh, I was wondering how you kind of got started into your path into climate science and what led you down um, the path to go to uh, your research. Uh, since, like, as I said, I had an astrophysics degree, but now I'm going into climate and more on the communication side. You're still pretty heavy in the physics, the science of it. So, yeah, just interested to see how the path went for you. Yeah, um, I was always interested in physics and mathematics as a kid. Uh, and, you know, when I moved to the States, uh, I started first uh, as a, a, a graduate student in physics, intending to get a PhD there. Uh, but I was always interested in the environment. And uh, when I started looking around for research problems, uh, I, I, I realized that the more applied problems interested me more. And, and one day I met a professor, professor of climate science and that was how everything started. And um, you know, I liked it. I, I think uh, I liked the fact that I can use my physics and maths background uh, to, to work on problems of, uh, you know, of societal interest. And also like the interdisciplinary interdisciplinarity because um, yeah. you learn climate kind of science has a lot of components to it uh, you learn about the atmosphere the oceans the land systems uh, cryosphere and so on and so forth and you, you get to talk to a lot of interesting people in related fields uh, you know it's like people interested in the climate information in economics or anthropology and so on and so forth um, yeah and in terms of like uh, communication um, I mean it's you know because I think we will as scientists we have an obligation uh, 
to communicate what we find uh, because you know, we are funded by uh, uh, the public, yeah. essentially. Uh, so we do have an obligation. And the obligation, I mean, my main I, communication is mainly with by teaching to students, uh, but, but I also do some public outreach as well. And then uh, that was one thing that definitely caught my eye. Climate as uh, climate courses and teaching, very interesting because for me as a learner, uh, that's like a lot of good information. But then also the since one thing that I'm trying to do more of uh, is specifically the communication side. So seeing that there is like education focused on that is really cool, uh, especially for people that aren't necessarily going into like, say, science communication strictly because, for example, that's my path. Um, but it's a pretty small field and most people aren't going to be going directly into that. So having that be a part of a broader program is really interesting. And mm -hmm. off of that, I wanted to ask, um, in terms of when you're communicating climate to students and when you're uh, teaching students about the communication of climate science, what are the kinds of things that you found to be most useful in those settings and those teachings, those like interactions? Yeah, I, I think um, the thing I like to communicate um, is the beauty of the earth and the climate system and actually of the field itself. Uh, I think here we can learn from astro, astronomy, astrophysics, because um, forgive me for saying this, uh, like astronomy has very little practical uses, but it is, you know, people are fascinated by it. Um, yeah. And I think uh, my approach is to try and, and communicate the fascination of the field. Um, and the reason being is because if you want people to pay attention to you, you have to make them care. Yeah. And making them care, it's, it's really more of an emotional uh, thing rather than an intellectual thing. Um, so for me, um, when I try to teach climate science, I try to make it very intuitive and understandable because I think people appreciate learning. Yeah. And when, they, when they learn something, they understand the beauty of the field or of knowledge. Um, when I do outreach, I try to use tools that help to visually uh, make it very uh, exciting and beautiful. Uh, so at the Lawrence School of Science, uh, they have a contraption called the Science on the Sphere. I don't know if you've ever seen been up there. I haven't, no. I've been oh, there, but I haven't seen that uh, uh, specific one. Okay. Um, it's a, basically a big uh, sphere suspended in space. Uh, it's like in a big room. And there's projectors all around it and for all four corners. So basically they project images of the earth and all, you know, all, all sorts of other things on the sphere. So if you look at it, it feels like um, you're in space looking down on the earth and oh. it's really beautiful. It sounds um, so very give, interesting. Yeah, so I give public talks uh, at uh, the Lawrence Hall of Science using that. You know, and I talk about you know, how the atmosphere, the air currents work, the ocean currents and so on and so forth. Yeah, I would imagine having a, uh, a physical, something people can see and really like be near and interact with for teaching that kind of thing, especially when it's such big scale as these are like currents going across like half of the earth um, as a really strong teaching tool. But then also <laughs> that aspect of wonder and beauty, I think is a really important for a lot of science. And then especially uh, climate science, it's when it's relating to the earth we live on, this is the place we call home. And these are things we don't necessarily normally see, but they're all around us and they uh, take form of a lot of things that we interact with in our life, but we might not see the bigger picture. I know that is something that comes up a lot in astro and physics since the, as you said, the practical appli uh, application is a lot of times, if it's there, it's going to be a bit of time before we get to it. So right now we're pursuing it. Um, we don't have that one-to-one -one kind of motivation um, for sure. And then I guess another communications question is would be what kind of climate infra what kind of climate information is the most challenging to convey and if we were stu your students um i guess that that'd be kind of the framing for that question and then what there so there's what's the most uh what's the most difficult and then what's the most important takeaway uh that we i guess you'd want people, students to take away when they're learning about climate. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I, I would say the most challenging thing would be the immediacy of the, uh, you know, so the 
climate changes. Um, and mainly because the information that we present is pretty abstract. Yeah. So for example, if we say uh, the, warm, the earth is gonna warm by two degrees uh, in the future, what does that mean? What does two degrees mean? You know? I've had um, friends so, confused by that, like just talking to them. Yeah, so, you know, so that's the hardest thing. Um, and you understand climate change intellectually, uh, but also not emotionally. Um, yeah. So, you know, so uh, climate change is a problem, uh, but it happens somewhere else uh, or it'll happen in the future. Uh, so that's really the big challenge that we have. Um, lately, it hasn't been as difficult because as you know, in California, uh, we've had this prolonged drought uh, yeah. since you know, uh, for the last decade. Uh, and then we, you know, more recently, the wildfires and whenever PG&E shuts off electricity to, you know, sorry, to people feel it. Yeah. Uh, we'll feel it. Um, so I think in that sense, um, some of the abstractness goes away. Um, yeah. And I think, and also I think the fact that we have the COVID crisis right now, uh, it's not obviously not climate change, uh, but it's a, a global problem. Yeah. And that makes people's lives. So I think that uh, does help make people uh, be aware that, uh, these sort of things do happen. Yeah. yeah. I, I think with uh, COVID kind of introduced us to the scale that a global problem can have. And I would say definitely I, before COVID, and I would assume a lot of other people, um, would never have thought that any sort of uh, threat or uh, stalling on that global scale could happen. Like, oh no, these types of businesses and governments and whatnot, it'll never be something bad enough that they like close down and stop so much interaction and commerce and all of that. But we see that it can happen in a few months. Um, mm -hmm. And with climate change being such a massive thing, unfortunately, uh, lasting a lot longer than a few months, but that gives it more time to enact more damage or get in the way uh, of w what we call normal, I guess, human life. Um, is too bad, but hopefully that can be a motivating factor in terms of action. And I think what you said about, um, said a couple times about the emotional side of it, luckily people are seeing that more. And I think as it's been talked about more and there are more voices crying out about how like this is really a big issue. Um, I think that emotional side of it is growing. I would say definitely a lot uh, of room for it to grow more to get action going faster, but it's definitely a thing that is growing and that is like important to realize and recognize. Um, and then I guess uh, one question I ask every one of my uh, guests is like either, I guess either personally or professionally in whichever way you care to answer it. Um, the name of the podcast and my climate communication stuff is 2030 because where I'm focused on what kind of action and consideration and conversation um, about climate change that has to happen now that has to we have we're going to see we're going to be on a certain path by 2030 as a first like big milestone of to see kind of if we're making significant progress or if we're really lagging behind so I guess uh, heading into uh, this decade of action as it as it has been called um, how are you feeling as we head towards 2030 um, about climate change about climate action um, optimistic pessimistic any other kind of framing because it's definitely not uh, what's the word a bipole uh, is probably a better word for that but yeah um, I'm I'm encouraged by the increase in awareness and communication uh, I think that's really what we need uh, to bring awareness and make you know it's like making addressing climate change a norm yeah right that, it's something that's immediate, it's urgent, and you have to do it. And, um, you know, uh, I've been, uh, you know, so I, in the like last 30 years or so, I've been working on climate, climate science. Uh, you know, I, I have seen a change in the, uh, so like the sort of how many people talk about climate and the sense of urgency and so on and so forth. So even within my own field, uh, so when I started off in graduate school, uh, you know, uh, we were all aware of global warming. Yeah. Uh, but you know, within my field, only a, a, a relatively small subset of people work on climate change issues, uh, climate sorry, global warming issues. Yeah. Um, that's not as much uh, now. I mean, twenty years, twenty you no, know, so like fast forward to today. Um, I would say a lot of people in my field are geared towards trying to understand and predict the future. 
yeah. So I think um, in that sense, I'm I'm pretty much I'm pretty encouraged by that. Well, that's um, now that yeah. That being said, I think um, uh, the pace of climate action has been quite slow. I mean, because from a scientific yeah. perspective, uh, you know, we we understand the carbon counting, right? So if we want to limit uh, global warming to say two degrees, as what the Paris Court asks us to do, yeah. Uh, to limit the you know, like danger of climate change, then it really limits it limits the amount of carbon dioxide we can emit into the atmosphere. So this whole conversation about we have to drastically reduce emissions really comes from that. It's it's yeah. an understanding of the carbon budget of the atmosphere. Yeah, and that is something. I guess it's uh, good to hear that you're encouraged. And I would say, in a similar way, I am um, with the how it does seem to be something that's a lot more people um for me i see it people outside of the field because i don't see directly in the field of climate science that there's now more people working on global warming um i hope that doesn't take away from other aspects of the field of just pursuing for interest but i understand that a mm -hmm. large problem coming up um attention gets directed at that um but and then also on the need for action uh that it does it can feel uh very slow um, and in terms of the scientific, the carbon budget, um, it's it's kind of a matter of fact of that's the budget to hit the degrees. And if we go over that, then it's uh, it's just cause and effect. And which I guess is kind of a lot of these conversations end up with some degree of optimism and yearning for more change and more action happening quicker, um, which I guess is... Uh, it's a mixed bag, um, but it is, I guess one thing is good about it, that it's a lot of people uh, that I'm talking to and that I see are, uh, at the, they're optimistic, but they are also, it's not, there's doesn't seem to be any level of complacency with the people that are involved in it. Um, there, there would be definitely some element of people as a whole not seeing it as an immediate threat and being complacent mm -hmm. to some degree there and communications. Uh, could definitely play a part in helping to do that, which I guess I'm trying to do here. Um, right. But that it's a matter of... Um, I kind of just lost my train of thought. Uh, but the complacency, or it's... Uh, when I'm talking to people, it's optimism, but there's not complacency in the, oh, we can do it, we'll get it done. It's not anything to worry about. It's, we can do this, but we need to do this. And it, it's kind of a a mixed bag on how much we are doing this right now. Um, yeah. I guess with that, um, are there any sort of other takeaways, whether from uh, climate science or people just interested in climate change that you would recommend to people in the sense of anything about understanding or if people should join organizations or they should look into anything? I guess just any sort of advice on that sense. Um, to people interested in anything climate? Um, well, I think um, one thing I would say is um, we all have a, a role to play in communicating climate science and or the, like the information climate scientists um, uh, have produced. Um, uh, the reason being is that, uh, you know, we've been uh, doing this for decades now. Yeah, uh, and even with that, uh, there's still a large segment of our population who either don't care or distrust uh, the science of climate change. Yeah. Um, so, and that really impedes action. Okay, and so you know, I think, but that also is an opportunity for all of us uh, because uh, the way people uh, get the information and is through trusted sources, right? It's through their friends or through the media they listen to. Um, but we are all trusted sources for our friends, our family, and yeah. that sort of thing. Uh, so that's, I mean, so, you know, like what you're doing right now, you know, you, you have your trusted sources for people, so you have the ability yeah. to change people's minds. Um, so I, I think that's the, that, that's the opportunity for us, uh, and we all have played a role in this. And in fact, this is something I tell my students. Uh, whenever they take my course uh, at the very end, I tell them, hey, uh, you now know more about climate science than most of the Earth's population. Um, I think you you should tell people about it because I yeah. think that's it's really important to do so. Yeah, something that came up um, 
I want to say uh, I wrote an article about it um, that the Yale uh, Center for Climate Change Communication, one of the things they found the, the best, one of the best, I think the best predictor for if people will vote for climate action or climate policies um, is if they have conversations about it with their friends and family. And it might not be like a one to one of just you have a conversation, somebody changes their vote like that. Um, but those are things that like correlate very highly. And out of all the things they researched, that was the number one, um, more so than uh, the other things had impacts like media consumption and habits and um, what, how, where they spend their time and all that. Um, but the number one was friends and family having conversations about it. So mm. and that is something obviously I'm trying to do it uh, more professionally and spending more time doing it. Um, but even for me, a lot of it is just conversation or sending links or any sort of like just interactions with my friends and family uh, about that. And it personally, it does seem like it's swayed. And I guess I have some data to back it up. So it's not just an anecdote. Um, and then hearing it from a Berkeley professor is another uh, point of strength to it. Um, so yeah, I guess that ends uh, all of the questions I had for you. Uh, if there's anything, um, first, thank you again for coming on. If there's anything you want to recommend to people either to follow you or to follow an organization you think is good or anything like that, whether it be a link or whatnot, uh, if you have any of those, feel free to uh, say them and I can link them in the description. Um, I don't have any right now, but I can, I'll send them to you. For, for okay. Fun. So then okay. anyone listening to this or watching this, uh, you can check the description uh, and the links will be there. So it'll be easy to click on because luckily this is the internet and uh, yeah, links can be delivered very well in that sense. Uh, yeah. So I think that does it for me. If there's, uh, is there anything else you would like to leave the audience with John or is that it? Oh, um, actually, I have a question for you, oh, Matt. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know uh, how you pivoted to kind of communication. I mean, you said you were an astronomy major. Yeah. And uh, how did that come about? So, um, one, cool to get a question to me for one. So, thank you. Uh, but so that was a, it was probably a mainly due to a graduate course I took at Berkeley because I was in astrophysics and I enjoy astrophysics and I think the science is astro and physics is really, really cool. I'm still like very interested in that, but I knew I didn't want to do lab work. I wanted to be, um, or I didn't see a way in which like the kind of work that I would have been doing would be more connected uh, to like the outside world. Um, and so I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I kind of came across science communication. Um, so I'm like, okay, that's a good blend. And then I took a graduate course with the journalism school at Berkeley um, with Professor uh, Elena Connes about uh, science misinformation and science disinformation. And so there was a study of the tobacco industry messing with uh, health science um, and then how all of those um, strategies essentially just transferred over to other things like acid rain or like the hole in the ozone and then most recently, and maybe most significantly, to climate change. And seeing the massive like effort to delay climate action and how we used to have, like the IPCC was founded um, at the like 30-ish years ago, I think in 1988. Um, and we've had multiple presidents, um, Democrat and Republican, be on board to fight climate change. Um, but then the amount of effort that went into stopping climate action um, by uh, various amounts of groups, lots of uh, special interests, uh, really it kind of turned me on to seeing that as um, a major issue. And then seeing the scope of climate change through that uh, showed me it was kind of like the major issue that I could see of our time. And then when I went to, uh, I did a master's in science communication, that kind of became the focus the focal point that I wanted to communicate. I was like, I want to do science communication. And this seems like the biggest topic in science uh, in terms of communication. Um, and so it kind of led to that. And then after I graduated, I just started pursuing that um, more so uh, through, and I started uh, through a lot of stuff like this, like the made some videos, um, I'm doing some of these podcast interviews and then write it, just writing about it um, in like a newsletter for family and friends. Um, so that was kind yeah, of the great, path um, into it for me. That's very interesting. I think the next time we teach communicate climate science, we'd like to, we should invite you to come 
uh, talk to us. Oh, I, I think it's still to be interested to see to hear about your experience. I would be more than honored to do so. Um, I th I think I could uh, give some sort of interesting talk. I guess one thing uh, would be related is that for me it was a lot of hmm. not knowing where I wanted to go. Um, yeah. And I guess there would have been a lot of things I could have done if I knew sooner. Like I could have taken some of your courses. That would have been very cool. Um, but even with that, I I still am in a place where like I, I'm happy with, even if I didn't do it earlier, I'm so happy that I'm doing it now. Um, and yeah, if you would want to hear me talk and have me talk to your students, I would again be more than honored and thrilled to. Wonderful. All right. Uh, so that should do it for the third episode of the 2030 podcast. I want to thank uh, John again for coming on. The conversation was very interesting uh, in a variety of ways, uh, having the climate change research and then also uh, like evidence and direct experience climate communications is not something that uh, I would expect to see a lot of. Uh, so when I can find it, that is, it's really uh, fulfilling and just cool to me. So thank you again very much for coming on. Um, and thank you, thank to you. and thank you to everyone uh, for listening or watching. Um, you can be sure to uh, follow the channel or wherever this gets posted because um, there'll be more talks like this and more climate videos, podcasts, and all that. So again, thanks, John, and thanks everybody. Bye.